Good day, my name is Jesse van der Zander and I'm a DECRA Fellow at the University of Sydney. In this talk, I wanna show you how we can use Milky Way analog galaxies to understand how the various properties of our own Milky Way, such as the galactic bulge and the thick disk might have formed. So in this talk, I wanna focus on three different galaxies. The first is our own Milky Way, the second is UGC 10738, which is a Milky Way analog, and the third is NGC 1032, a galaxy with a very similar stellar mass as our own Milky Way, yet has a distinctly different bulge component. But the key takeaway of my talk is going to be that if we want to understand how bulges and thick disks form, we need to look at galaxies edge on with deep Mu's IFS data. So let me begin with our own Milky Way galaxy. In my opinion, the ESA Gaia mission combined with other galactic archaeology surveys, such as Apogee and Galar and Rave and various others, are currently driving a paradigm shift in our understanding of our Milky Way. In particular, I think that we're learning that relatively minor merger events, such as Gaia and Celadus, but also the Sagittarius Dwarf, can have a significant impact on how the disk of our own galaxy evolves. And in our own galaxy, we're learning about the thin disk, the thick disk, the flaring of the thin disk, but also various central components, such as the short and long bar within the bulge, um, that seem to indicate that galaxy formation is a very complex process. Unfortunately, much of this complexity is lost or sometimes ignored by extragalactic galaxy evolution models because we simply do not have the detailed data to do the same type of measurements. I think this is now changing with Muse. But to continue a little bit further on our own Milky Way galaxy, for me, one of the most recent and interesting discoveries has been the variety that we're seeing in the alpha components versus metallicity as a function of radius and as a function of off the plane of the disk. And so for example, the alpha rich and alpha poor components of our own Milky Way have been known for a while, but how they vary was really nicely demonstrated in this paper from Michael Hayden et al, 2015. So as a function of the distance from the galactic center shown horizontally here versus the distance of the galactic plane, you're seeing a variety of different stellar populations. Towards the central parts, you're actually seeing that this alpha iron versus this metallicity can be explained by a single population. But things get a lot more complex if you go out to the solar neighborhood shown here in panel two and five. Here, we're seeing that classic alpha rich and alpha poor distribution, which is very hard to explain by a single event. In fact, the discovery of the alpha rich and alpha poor disk could imply that this rare bimodality was formed in a merger um, that triggered new set of star formation. Here, you've got an initial burst of star formation gets quenched, but then a rare merger occurs that triggers another set of star formation. And so in this case, it's actually been shown by simulations that this is a rather rare event. Probably less than 5% of galaxies like around Milky Way might have experienced such an event. The alternative to this alpha rich and alpha poor disk is that it's actually a natural consequence of how the alpha elements are produced. It is the delay time between type two supernova and type one A supernova that causes this bimodality. And if you combine this with radial migration, you can actually explain the alpha to iron versus metallicity diagram in our solar neighborhood rather well. The problem is that if you try to understand what caused this bimodality in our Milky Way and then invoke a merger, you're limited by the sample size. We only have one Milky Way galaxy, which only shows us one possible formation history. So the idea is, if you now start to look for this bimodal alpha distribution in other galaxies, we might learn something about how our own Milky Way might form, including how mergers might have impacted both the disk and the bulge. And so this is what we've done. We've used this galaxy called UGC 10738, which is a Milky Way-like galaxy. And by Milky Way-like here, I mean it has the same stellar mass, it has the same color, but also the same morphology. So it has this classic disk with a dust lane, but it also has this boxy peanut bulge, which is indicative for a buckled bar in edge galaxies. 
So let's have a look in detail at UGC 10738. It has a rotational pattern, very typical of disk galaxies with a maximum rotation velocity that is very similar to our Milky Way. If we look at the velocity dispersion, we're again seeing similar patterns as our Milky Way, where in the thin plane of the disk, we're seeing a low dispersion. And as you go towards the center in the bar region, but also towards this, this center here, we're seeing a much higher velocity dispersion. We've also looked at the skewness of the line of sight velocity distribution, which tells you something about the type of orbits within this galaxy. Typical for a rotating edge galaxy without dust, you would see a strong anti-correlation between H3 and velocity. However, this is not observed in UGC 10738. This either means that the orbital components are more complex or that we need to take into account the different distributions of dust as we're peering piercing through the galaxy along the line of sight. More interestingly is to look at the stellar population properties. So the age distribution shows us very similar to our own Milky Way, meaning that towards the center we're seeing a higher age and along this plane uh, of the thin disk we're seeing a young population where most of the young stars have been formed. If we look at metallicity we're seeing that towards the center um, and in this thin disk region, we're seeing the highest metallicity, although there's some evidence that the dust region, this dusk, edge on dusk, is impacting our metallicity results. But most interestingly, we're seeing the same alpha enhancement as our own Milky Way, meaning that when you look in this thin disk here, you're seeing a low alpha to iron, and as you go off the plane of the disk, you're starting to see much higher alpha to iron as indicated indicated by these red colors. But so far, I've only shown you what the results are for UGC 10738 without offering a direct comparison to our Milky Way. What I'm going to do now is actually show the Milky Way side by side with UGC 10738 in a figure showing the projected radius versus the projected height. So for the Milky Way, we're using the data um, we're using models from Galaxia, it's developed by Sanjeev Sharma, that offer a direct comparison between the Milky Way and other galaxies. So for the metallicity, which is the first panel I'm showing, indeed in the Milky Way we're finding that the metallicity is the highest along the plane of the disk, and as you go off the plane or towards larger radius, you're getting a decrease in metallicity. We're seeing the same global behavior for UGC 10738, with the exception again of this region here between 0 and 0.5 kpc, which is impacted by dust. But other than that, we're seeing the same lower metallicity towards larger radius and off the plane of the disk. For the ages, we're again seeing the same trends, meaning that if you're far off the plane and towards the center, you're finding the oldest ages. And as you go towards larger radius, and closer to the plane of the disk, you're seeing younger stellar populations. For the alpha to iron, the alpha enhancement, we're also seeing very similar trends, meaning that close to the plane of the disk, we're seeing low alpha to iron. And as you go towards the thick disk region and towards the center, you're seeing an increase in alpha to iron. The only difference between the Milky Way model here and our own data is that we're not seeing the same increase at the highest regions of the plane. Um, so this is something that we are exploring further. But to take this one step further actually is to do a direct comparison of our Milky Way as shown here by the black contours as compared to our data for UGC 10738, which is shown in the red regions here. So this is a similar figure to Hayden et al using the same data from Apogee where we're showing the distance from the center for every panel versus the distance of the plane. Each panel shows the alpha to iron versus metallicity. And whilst this can only give you a qualitative comparison, because for UGC 10738, we only have two alpha components that we can measure. If you look, for example, the region around the solar radius, you're seeing the same type of behavior, meaning that close to the plane of the disk, the majority of the mass in stars is in this low alpha, high metallicity re regime, and as you go further and further off the plane of the disk, you're seeing this alpha rich component increase. So what are the implications of this result? Well, the fact that we're finding an alpha enhanced rich 
an alpha enhanced disk off the plane for the first galaxy that we're looking at seems to indicate that maybe this bimodal alpha enhancement isn't created by a special or rare event. Instead, our results on the detection of this alpha enhanced thick disk component in an edge or Milky Way analog seem to suggest that maybe this is just the default way disks are being built. And this is backed up by discoveries of other alpha enhanced disks in other galaxies, as well as by recent cosmological zoom in simulations that show the natural occurrence of these alpha rich disks in disk galaxies. The good thing about this is that our Milky Way might not be as unique as previously thought. We don't require a special event for our Milky Way galaxy's thick disk to be formed. So that's a good thing because it means that we can use our Milky Way as a template for understanding how other disk galaxies could have formed. As I said, we have seen alpha enhanced disk in other galaxies. For example, here on the top right is a lenticular galaxy in the Fornax 3D survey, FCC 17 by Francesca Pinna et al., but also in this um, other as A as B type galaxy, NGC 5746, um, which is from Marie Martique's work. And I highly recommend watching her talk uh, about this galaxy as well. But now you might think I've been talking about thick disks, alpha rich disks, how does this relate to the formation of bulges. And to make that link, I'm going to show this galaxy right here, NGC 1032. It has a similar stellar mass as our own Milky Way, yet it looks like it has a much bigger bulge than our own galaxy. And indeed, when you do a two component fit with an edge on disk plus a bulge component, where n equals 3.5, you indeed find that most of the light gets attributed to the bulge. 71% versus 29% in the disk. However, as soon as you start adding a thick disk component to the fit, so now you do a free component, you actually see that a lot of the light in the bulge or in the central component gets decreased and the vast majority of mass is in this thick and thin disk. 31% in the central components versus 21 and 48 in the thick and thin disk. So maybe the bulges that we're looking at when we're doing a simple bulge to disk decomposition could actually be contributed to thick disks. For NGC 1032, I think the answer lies in deep mu's IFS data that does not yet exist. So this emphasizes the fact that we really need to look at galaxies um, with deep integral field spectroscopy data if we want to understand how these bulges form. So to conclude, I think that edge-on Milky Way-like galaxies offer a unique insight into how disk galaxies in general form. If we want to learn something about our own Milky Way, we need to look at other possible scenarios in disk galaxy assembly. Edge-on galaxies also offer a unique view on how the bulges and thick disks might have formed. Because when you look at minor merger accretion events, these are actually best extracted off the plane of the disk out in the disk, meaning going far out and up above. The reason for it is that minor mergers leave their imprint in the thick disk, which is hard to pick up when you look at a galaxy face on. So I'm going to finish by saying that if we really want to reveal the origin of bulges and thick disks, we need a much larger sample with MUSE IFS data on edge on galaxies. Thank you.